Thank you. Forgive me for framing my paper in a sufficiently broad way to allow me room to maneuver uh, between these ideas of sovereignty and uh, national institutions and the pressure from Europe. I did that uh, on purpose really to decide, uh, having heard some of the contributions, which area I would focus in on and uh, illuminate rather with some examples from my own experience practicing uh, in human rights law. Um, uh, but before I became a human rights lawyer, uh, I was a tax lawyer and risk management is one of the big things uh, that we talk about in taxation. So it struck me, um, just considering this conference and how it's gone so far, what kind of advice I would give uh, from a risk management perspective. Um, the first thing that concerned me was there were no trigger warnings whatsoever before anyone's speeches. So that's very concerning from a risk management perspective. Uh, the second thing was nobody stood up and introduced themselves with their selected pronouns. Um, very concerning about that as well. Uh, third thing is uh, King Leopold II, King of the Belgians, uh, who is a paragon of heteronormative white Western colonial male values is, is hanging there. That's totally unacceptable as well from a risk management perspective. Um, Queen Marie is allowed to stay so long as we put some kind of indication on that painting that she is a feminist ally, maybe a, a flag, LGBT flag, of course. And then finally, um, a number of people use the term created order, uh, which is an incredibly transphobic term and totally unacceptable. So I think from a risk management perspective, if you bring all of these questions together, the question for you is, could we possibly see this same conference in this format held in Europe in the next number of years as we see our rights continuously eroded, particularly in freedom of expression? So uh, while obviously I was being somewhat lighthearted, we're going to allow uh, King Leopold to stay, uh, the question we have to ask ourselves is really, how much longer are we able to use terms like creative order? How much longer are we allowed to criticize the growth of uh, the gender ideology in our schools and so on before we find ourselves, and this very gathering, raided by police and some of us with personal and professional consequences for using these terminologies. And that isn't an abstract question because if you were here this morning, you heard from an incredibly brave lady whom I, with my colleagues Paul Coleman and Matty Sankamo, have the absolute pleasure and honor of representing, that is Dr. Paivi Rasnan, MP, member of the Finnish Parliament, who is on trial now for her expression of her deeply held beliefs those same beliefs, uh, which are, as she described very eloquently, cornerstones of Western Christianity. And now in a Western liberal democracy, they're the subject of over 13 hours of police interrogation and three criminal charges brought before. She probably, uh, in fact, the, the, the prosecution has not sought a custodial sentence, a jail sentence, for the very reason that they don't want a political prisoner, as somebody mentioned earlier, in Finland. But they're going to fine her potentially up to 20,000 euro. They've given guidelines that they want uh, 160 days of her salary as the fine for her tweeting a verse from the Bible. So for all of us in this room, if that's happening in Finland, have we prepared ourselves for the consequences of the growth of hate speech laws? Have we reckoned with the idea that very soon, in Western liberal democracies such as Finland, there will be personal and professional and criminal consequences for using some of the very terminology that we've heard on this panel today and other panels over the course of this conference. So there's three ways I'll approach this. First is just a brief remark about uh, what I think we'd all agree is the tsunami of nonsense that we're dealing with at the moment in contemporary culture. The second one is this concept of freedom of expression and how it finds its grounding in the existing protections in international law, what the, European, what the Grand Chamber of the European Court, Court of Human Rights described as the cornerstone of democracy. And then finally, how things are going to get worse, uh, which is the Euroization of hate speech, and in particular, the uh, intervention really of the European Commission into the area of hate speech. This was mentioned by um, Pivey in her speech this morning and I'm going to just deal with that, uh, not too technically, but mention how real this ought to be as a concern for everybody in this room. So um, we're, many of us are staying in the same hotel and we've seen that the hotel is, quote, committed to sustainability. Uh, I flew to this conference from an airport that described itself as being on a journey to being carbon neutral. 
Um, these things, of course, are nonsense. Um, these are part of the tropes, the metaphors, the slogans uh, that we're all bombarded with constantly. And they're not designed, frankly, uh, to do anything other than to identify right think from wrong think. They are de designed to, in, in many ways, as Theodore Dalrymple famously said, to demoralize. That's the function of pure propaganda. It's demoralization. The majority of people will unthinkingly parrot these phrases, these expressions, but for those of us who think about them, their proliferation in every corner of life, in education, in her hotel rooms, uh, and in, in commercial venues, and increasingly sadly in our churches, is all part of a process of demoralization. Um, and uh, also to, as it were, in many ways, make those who hold these set of attitudes and, and beliefs feel better about themselves. It's uh, like many of my friends who will tweet about human right abuses, but still go out and buy Nike shoes made by uh, factory workers in countries where there is absolutely no uh, provision for human rights whatsoever. <laughs> However, conversely, on the same uh, end of, of, of all of this, one of the other things uh, that we find in contemporary society is when, when you speak the truth, uh, the reaction becomes increasingly visceral the further the society drifts into a fantasy land about human nature. And uh, all societies have had speech codes, of course. It's a question of what we regard as, as sacred and beyond criticism. But uh, the room for criticizing some of the sacred cows of our particular uh, era has grown narrow and narrow. I'm a millennial, and from what I can see under the blinding lights, most of the audience actually are part of my generation or younger. And uh, the research from, from the Pew Foundation and others shows that our generation is incredibly intolerant of free expression, is incredibly supportive of more and more measures to close down free speech. And this is, if we cannot communicate about all the other things that we've heard here today, if we don't have the room and the space to be able to freely express these ideas. This is the front line in our battle in terms of uh, a question of sovereignty, of course, which is the subject of this panel, but also within our own countries as well, uh, the creeping use of these hate speech laws. So on the cornerstone of a democratic society, where, where, where do we find that expression? What does it mean in the context of uh, Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which, express, or which protects the freedom of expression? Um, that is exactly the phrase that the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights used in a well-known case called Handyside in the UK in 1976. And they linked freedom of expression not simply as uh, an expressive act that's important for the individual concerned, but as a critical facet of a functioning democracy. Their view was that you could not have an open, tolerant, liberal society without freedom of expression being protected. However, as time went on up to the present day, uh, and particularly accelerating in the last number of years, they've moved away from that standard decisively. And the increasing use of the term hate speech, which has no clear legal parameter or definition, other than really speech that they hate, uh, has found its way into the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights. And they've decided essentially, once something is classified as hate speech, it doesn't even attract the protections of Article 10 of the European Convention. It's simply uh, regarded as beyond even the scope of human rights law. So the more and more things that are regarded as hate speech, the less and less the court is willing to step in to protect them. And I'll give you some examples. And uh, if this is recorded, uh, I just want to be clear to the hate speech police that I am quoting cases uh, from the European Court of Human Rights, um, saying Mohammed was a paedophile. That was found to be hate speech in X versus Austria, saying that homosexuality is degenerate. That was found to be hate speech in Lidenhall versus Iceland, saying that abortion doctors are like Nazis. That was found to be hate speech in Annan versus Germany. A number of years previously, in the same line of Annan cases, the court made the exact opposite, the precise opposite finding, that the German prosecution of a, an anti-abortion activist for saying, uh, or pro-life activist, I should say, I'm using their phraseology there, um, the, the German prosecution of that same activist for making those same remarks was found to be an impermissible infringement of his rights under Article 10. What's changed? What's changed, uh, I have my own opinion, of course, what changed in the intervening years was, was Brexit and the election of Donald Trump 
and the refugee crisis in Europe and the realization in some of the European institutions that uh, various, uh, as it were, cornerstones in their view of the liberal human rights order were now under attack, uh, that they clamped down in a major way on upholding uh, freedom of expression. And I think most shockingly of all, of course, even if you don't uh, agree with the examples I gave, we heard this morning that quoting the Bible is hate speech in Finland. And uh, I think that brings us to the question of sovereignty. Pivey mentioned briefly in, in her remarks that hate speech was an imported idea into the Finnish domestic law, and that's correct. It's there by virtue of Finland signing the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. It also appears as well through guidance from the Council of Europe in terms of uh, protecting uh, people from intolerance and racism. And the section in uh, section 10 of the Finnish uh, criminal code that encodes this hate speech concept as ethnic agitation is rarely invoked in Finland. There are very few cases. So what you have is a provision in Finnish law that came from international law. You have judges who have to try and decide what that means in practice. And then they go back to international courts to discover what the meaning of these terms is so that they can then import further into Finnish domestic law what constitutes hate speech. So you have a perfect circle of ideas coming from outside the country that have no domestic provenance in uh, the local law that have to be interpreted then only by virtue of sources outside the country again. It's the precise opposite of any concept of uh, legal sovereignty. And I think uh, there are many things we can talk about from environmental law to labor law, but I think on this question of expression, it becomes very clear to us uh, what the problem, uh, what is the, the, the contours of the problem. And then finally, how are things going to get worse? And I suppose that uh, is of, of particular concern to us. Um, and this was mentioned again by PIV, and I just wanted to kind of expand on it. Um, I think many of us in the room are aware that the European Commission has adopted uh, a communication, quote, extending the list of EU crimes to hate speech and hate, hate crime. And it aims to bring forward a decision then for the European Council in due course to deal with that. Euro crimes or European crimes are already contained in Article 83 of the TEFU, the, the Treaty on the Function of the, of the European Union. And they include money laundering, terrorism, uh, people trafficking, and other forms of serious cross-border crime. And to that, the European Commission wants to add hate speech. So as far as they're concerned, you know, holding up the Bible and other manifestations of it that I mentioned in the other cases is up there with terrorism, money laundering, and people trafficking in terms of the danger it poses to Europe. And without any sense, really, as I say, where we find the contours legally of what constitutes hate speech, because of the contradictory decisions we have from the European Court of Human Rights. It, 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 uh, it strikes fear in my heart to think what's going to happen when the Court of Justice in Luxembourg gets its hands on this concept and how it starts to expand it. Um, the European Union is a far more dangerous organization than the European Court of Human Rights when it gets its hands on a concept such as this because the European Union can, as we've seen uh, with, with the examples of Hungary and Poland, impose very serious financial penalties on countries for failure, let's say, to uh, enact or give, give uh, some sort of domestic legal recognition to concepts around uh, cooperation on the prosecution of hate speech and so on. We've already seen the EU drift into this territory with these, at the moment, voluntary code of conduct on online hate speech, where the key measure, year after year from the European Union, is not whether freedom of expression is being protected online, but how much content the uh, social media companies and the internet companies are removing. That's the only question that they really highlight. How much content has been taken down and how quickly is it being taken down? So already we see a drift in the European institutions towards censorship and, as I say, when hate speech becomes a Euro crime, uh, the problem is only compounded. So this, all of mat this matters really in a concrete way for those of us who take a position in public advocacy in our own countries around protecting, as we say, the created order and human flourishing as we've been discussed. I think we have to, all of us, decide, and, and I echo the challenge that uh, our, our Hungarian member of the European Parliament mentioned, uh, whether we're prepared to accept the consequences that come with directly defending these rights. Pai V. Raznan has been prepared to accept those consequences, and they have been very enormous for her so far, and they continue to be. 
we genuinely have to now prepare ourselves for a price that we will have to pay professionally and personally. Um, there are ways to deal with this. I certainly think there are allies that we can find on freedom of expression across the political spectrum. There are those on the left who have been very concerned as well uh, about the erosion uh, of freedom of expression. J.K. Rowling was, a, I don't know her politics as such, but she was a certainly good example of a popular cultural figure who has been the victim of uh, cancel culture. But cancel culture becomes far more dangerous when you get a knock on the door from uh, the policeman wearing a pink rainbow badge and carrying a rainbow truncheon. And that is the future that we will have to contend with so long as the continuing erosion of Article 10 continues. And I think personally, uh, as an Irishman, of course, uh, I would quote the other great graduate of Trinity College, uh, Edmund Burke's uh, predecessor, Jonathan Swift. We must engage in satire. We must be creative about how we mock this new emperor because he certainly has no clothes. And we must use the rights that we have available to us now before they're taken away. Thank you very much.